Well, hey guys, and welcome to another Ask Zach. I'm Zach Childs. I think uh, probably uh, you might think that we're going to be talking about a guy that used a Paisley guitar, and you're right. And uh, his first name is not Brad, and his first name is James, <laughs> James Burton. And uh, all those great licks that I played at the beginning uh, came from James Burton. So one of the things, people talk about how important James Burton was, but a lot of times they don't talk about why. So today on Ask Zach, we're going to say, why is James Burton one of the most important electric guitar players of the last 60 years or more than that? So first off, uh, you know, James took a lot of different techniques and kind of pulled them together. Now, there might have been other people doing them, but he picked up all these different things from people that he was playing with or records that he was listening to. Uh, also, he was on a lot of major recordings, you know, playing with Ricky Nelson, playing with Elvis, playing with Emilio Harris, uh, Merle Haggard, all those things. You know, he was showcasing a lot of these playing styles. He was on the Ozzy and Harriet show, uh, which was... Again, one of the, the biggest shows on television in the 50s and 60s. And so he was on just about every week with Ricky playing a song. And most of the time he was playing a Telecaster. So I would argue that if you distill it down to Telecaster players, that James Burton is the first really important Telecaster player. Now, some of you might argue with me that uh, Jimmy Bryant... Now, Jimmy Bryan obviously came before him and was a virtuoso, but few p people could play like him, and Jimmy wasn't playing on a bunch of people's records. Now, of course, he and Speedy West were doing these great instrumental albums, and you, you know, again, phenomenal virtuoso playing by Jimmy. But he was not the influential guitar player that James Burton was. James Burton defined what the Telecaster style of guitar playing. Everything kind of comes from him. So the songs I played at the beginning were all to showcase some different style that he had or things that he brought to music. So one, the first one was Susie Q. Now that was an instrumental that he wrote and then Dale Hawkins added words to. And James unfor unfortunately didn't get in any writer credit on that which is a big deal when you talk about the money involved in it. But uh, when you look at Suzy Q, you can hear the Lightning Hopkins influence. So I had read that Lightning Hopkins was an influence on James, but I didn't realize it until I actually listened, listened to Lightning Hopkins. And then you go, okay, Suzy Q sounds like a Lightning Hopkins type guitar lick. Another thing kind of related to that is that the, uh, the posters for Elvis's first appearance at the International Hotel in 1969 in Las Vegas. You know, of course, it has Elvis in big letters and the other performers, but it says blues guitarist James Burton. It's interesting because most people don't say, oh, James is a blues guitarist, but really he is. I mean, he covers different styles, but he's kind of a blues guitar player. So Suzy Q definitely showcases that. Uh, the next thing I played, uh, after Suzy Q was uh, Ricky Nelson's uh, Just Can't Quit. So that was a later Ricky Nelson tune. It wasn't a huge, huge hit, but it was influential. And I just loved the, the kind of the sixth, what, um, what some people call the horn part. So you have the... So that track is actually why, well, after hearing it, Merle Haggard hired or had, you know, James hired to play on his records because he really liked what he called a horn part. And uh, James played some of those parts on some of Merle's, you know, records. You'll hear that kind of sixth, you know, kind of coming down on that. Uh, yeah, another one was uh, Working Man Blues where you start hearing the chicken picking thing. Now the original is an A flat. He actually used a capo on it. And if you use a capo, you get a lot closer to what he originally played. Uh, then uh, Too Far Gone, the Emily Harris tune. 
uh, great half step bends. You get that. Really sweet playing on uh, Amy Lou and, and Graham's records. You get to hear a lot of James's really sweet kind of ballad and melodic playing. Also, you hear a lot of that actually on the live uh, John Denver stuff. There's some uh, live recordings uh, from when James was part of uh, John Denver's touring band, and he played a lot of sweet melodic stuff on those uh, kind of folky, easy listening tunes. Uh, Ooh, Las Vegas, the Graham Parsons tune that, of course, Emmylou also recorded. There you get the, the banjo, you know, type playing the... That's another fantastic, you know, playing style that he brought to the forefront. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the bottle let me down. And you know, Chicken pecking. Now, on the original, he tuned the low E string down to D so he could end with that low D, and that's that's really nice. That's another thing that he was doing was he was uh, he would tune down his uh, low E string down to D or sometimes to C on the Rodney Crowell tune "Ain't Living Long Like This." The original recording of it from the late '70s on his first Warner Brothers record, you can hear James using uh, this low E string tuned down to C. Another technique that uh, James did that brought, you know, again, brought to the forefront was uh, bending behind the nut and using harmonics, you know. So he would do that kind of thing. Also, you get kind of the tic-tac kind of playing that um, on uh, Someday Soon, uh, which uh, Ju Judy Collins uh, that's a song that features James and Buddy Emmons. Buddy Emmons playing steel. And, uh, you know, you get uh, Burton playing these kind of tic-tac parts where he's kind of muting, palm muting, and then playing with his pig. So, that's a neat part. Um, talk a little bit about strings. So... Another thing that people would talk about is, you know, James Burton, you know, and, and strings. So, uh, you know, of course, everyone was using kind of uh, 12 through 52, somewhere around there as far as regular electric guitar strings, and uh, there was nothing else lighter available. And that's what James used, and you can hear him using that, like on Susie Q. Uh, you can hear that on the, uh, the Bob Lumen stuff, like This Is The Night. There's a, a clip of him from the movie uh, Rock and Roll Circus uh, playing that tune, and he's playing his Blackguard Telecaster, and he's got those uh, 12 through 52 gauge strings. And you can see the way he played pre-light gauge strings, and it's interesting to see that because it's more straight-up you know, rockabilly guitar playing. Then uh, while working with Ricky, he decided to uh, find a way to get lighter a lighter guitar you know, string set. And so what he did was he took four banjo strings and two guitar strings. So he used the D string as an A string, and he used the A string as the low E string, and then he used four banjo strings. Now a lot of people will mention this, but they won't mention the part that banjo strings have a loop end. They do not have a ball at the end. So James was having to sacrifice two sets of strings to do this, and he was having to take take those four banjo strings. He was having to take a ball in, put it in there carefully, and twist it around just right, so then you could run it through the back of your Telecaster and uh, and uh, do that. And uh, so that was a, a huge thing. Now other people, again, were doing similar things to get an unwound third, but James pretty had pretty much had the lightest set. And uh, that was a 9, 10, 12, 24, 32, 38. I'm using the exact same set, except I'm using a 42 here because I didn't have a 38 lying around. I have to admit, this is a hard set to play on. And I'm used to playing either 10s or 9.5 set. Um, but 
not this light. And that 10 for a B string and that 12 for a G string, it's actually kind of hard to play on because one thing you don't think about is lighter gauge strings, you have to, you have to bend them further to get to the same pitch. And uh, so it, it feels weird when you, you feel like you're bending the string, you know, almost halfway across the neck just to get a, a whole step bend. So, but uh, that's the deal with, with this set. Uh, you know, of course, James met with uh, Ernie Ball. Ernie Ball took measurements off his strings, but he did not, Ernie Ball did not copy James's, uh, you know, string set because he, you know, because again, it was super light. But that was another thing that influenced Ernie Ball to start selling, uh, you know, having guitar strings made at first uh, with an unwound third. Uh, so that guitars were just, electric guitars were easy to play, you know, for students. Uh, just to take a quick aside on this guitar, this is a Bill Crook uh, Tele style. So you might be saying, well, why does it have a Fender logo? Well, I was a bad guy and I reshaped the headstock and I had a Fender logo put on there. I also uh, found a uh, patent number bridge that I put on there. These are old C and J tooling steel saddles. Um, this is a Voodoo, a Peter Florence pickup, which uh, just makes me really sad that Peter Florence passed away in 2019. He was such an amazing person, such an amazing pickup winder. Uh, Golly, what a great what a great player he was, and I loved how his pickups, even when they were played clean, had like this little bit of hair on them. Really nice. The Broadcaster set, the TE50, is a great pickup. Again, these pickups are, are not around, and and I don't believe anyone knows how he made them. So I mean, that's just lost forever. Uh, this is a Adder pickup that, of course, is no longer in business. Uh, it was a pickup that uh, Bill Crook started using. Uh, and of course, look at this beautiful paisley finish. This is amazing. I, no one does anything like this. Fender doesn't. Uh, the, the closest thing, uh, Tokai made some paisley tellies in the 80s, part of their Breezy Sound series that, was, that had the right look to them. But otherwise, I think everyone has done it completely wrong. Completely wrong. So this is paper that Bill Crook painstakingly made him had made himself and uh, so yeah so this is an alder body and then you have the uh, paisley finish and you have a maple cap neck you have a uh, reissue f style tuners on it and yeah so that's uh, that's this guitar and then I've got those really crazy light gauge uh, strings on there so I've also uh, made up a Spotify playlist of some of you know, what I think are James Burton's kind of most important tracks. And I've tried to kind of follow the timeline through and, uh, and I didn't always pick the most popular tunes. I tried to pick the ones that really showcased his playing the most. Uh, let's talk about James's gear. So in 1952, when James was 13, his parents made a big investment into his career. They paid $189, uh, which in today's money, if you take in inflation into account, that's about $2,000. They spent $2,000 on, on a Black Guard Telecaster for James Burton. And it was a great investment. He soon began modifying it. It became sunburst and it was red. It was a bunch of different colors. Uh, then in the early, you know, then he started painting it red with a, and he got a white pit guard to put on it uh, by the early 60s. And he painted it red multiple times. And then I asked him when I, I met him at the opening of a Chet Atkins exhibit at the Country Music Hall of Fame here in Nashville. I asked him about the guitar and he said that the finish that's on it right now, that has been on it since 1969. So. Forrest White and some of the Fender Cats saw Elvis in Vegas. James was playing his 52 Tele that was painted red with a white pit guard. And uh, they, they felt like the guitar, you know, the Fender guys were embarrassed because of how beat up the guitar was. <laughs> Relic, relicking wasn't cool yet. 
So they offered to refinish it. And James, you know, James said that he was you know, happy to do it. So they matched the color, which was this Coronado red, which matched the color of James's Cadillac car. And he took the guitar down there. And as soon as when he did it, he said, I knew that they were going to change out the parts. So I purposely took the bridge and the hardware and the pickups. I took everything with me so that they could refinish the body. And then I could bring back my parts to make sure I got my original parts back and put them on there. How smart that was. Because otherwise that original Blackguard pickup would have been gone. The pots, everything. So he played that guitar for just a little bit longer. And then they gave him a Paisley Telly in uh, in 69. So the early Elvis stuff again, the, uh, which I put this on the on the on the playlist. Uh, there's you know material from 1969 with Elvis that's live, and that's the 52 Telly painted red into a twin reverb. Uh, and then after that, they gave him the Telly. He starts playing the Pink Paisley. The Pink Paisley starts getting modified. It gets a little switch right here, which the switch controlled a Red Rhodes pickup that had was kind of a tapped pickup that had two coils one inside the other some something like that and he the way james described it to me when i asked him about it was it would give him a boost and it would sound fatter sound more like a les paul so then he put a six saddle fender bridge on there and then now it has a it's either a schecter or a goto style brass bridge with six saddles on it and then also now if you look really closely, the neck on that 69 Paisley is actually a new neck that the Fender Custom Shop made for him. And it has Klusen machine heads instead of F-tuners, and it's way too clean. Um, I asked James about the guitar, and he said that he didn't like to uh, have guitars refretted. And so instead of having a, a guitar refretted, he would just retire it. And so that's why he retired the red guitar, the 52, and that's why he retired the pink paisley you know why he, well he had another neck put on it and then of course he the signature models amps he kind of used uh he's famous for using blackface amps he also used a brown vibrasonic a lot um and of course in the early days he used a, a gretsch amplifier and uh, then fender you know, amps so uh yeah so that's kind of a, a good overview of of james burton and and why He's an important player. So thank you for watching. Please check out my uh, Spotify playlist of James Burton tracks. Please comment on the video. Please subscribe. Please share it with others. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Adios. Mm -hmm.